Okay, we are finally live, and uh, so glad to see everybody here today. Um, sad to hear that some of you are experiencing some after effects of COVID. I know other people who that's happening to, and uh, so just be uh, praying for one another. I know you guys do. I really appreciate that very much that you're pr praying for one another. And uh, I appreciate your prayers as well. Uh, today we are continuing on in 1 Corinthians to 1 Corinthians 3. And it's talking about division in the church again. And we'll start at verse 1. Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food. For you are not ready for, for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. Uh, you're still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere men? What after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, and God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each one will be rewarded according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. You know, Christian maturity is defined in the Bible as the ability to discern good from evil so that we will not be tossed about by the waves of false teaching and deceitful scheming of men. We learn that in Hebrews 5.14, but solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Constant use, that's an important uh, element. Also Ephesians 4, 13 and 14, until we all reach unity in the faith and then the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. But the Christians at Corinth weren't ready for solid food. They were still acting like baby Christians, even though I'm sure they thought they were mature in the faith. Well, what is the sign of immaturity in Christians? It's that they're still worldly. Interesting, huh? They have not truly crucified the flesh but are still acting like they did when they were uh, in and of the world. Galatians 5.24 says those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Those who are worldly exhibit some of the sins of non-believers, such as jealousy and arguing among themselves. These were not the only problems in the church of Corinth, and Paul addresses a number of issues in his letter. But this first one is a problem that we still have today among Christians. Christians in our modern times still argue among themselves as to which teacher they're following uh, and who is superior. Back in Paul's day, the Corinthians had been causing division among themselves. One person would say, I follow Paul, another, I follow Apollos. Today, many false teachers are out there trying to get followers to themselves. That's their whole purpose. Notice the difference be between those kind of people and Paul. True apostles like Paul and missionaries like Apollos were humble men. They often reminded the church that they were simply servants of God who brought the gospel message and were about the business of discipling people. But they were not discipling people to themselves, nor were they the ones to cause Christians to grow in Christ. 
Men may plant and water, but it's God who makes things grow. Remember John 14, 26, but the counselor of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. So it's God who makes us grow. It's the Holy Spirit living in us that teaches us and causes us to grow up into maturity in Christ. How does he do that? He does it through the written word. Ephesians 6, 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Hebrews 4, 12, for the word of God is living and active. It's not dead. It's not some dead, dusty book. Is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Uh, it nudges the thoughts. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The spirit uses the word of God not only to defend us from evil, but to build us up in the faith. The word of God is not some dead book. It's living and active and able to make us discerning people. The Holy Spirit is the one who opens our understanding to the word of God so it can be applied to our lives. Ephesians 1.17, I keep asking that the, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. That's the whole deal, man. We need to know him better. Are you learning to know him better? Paul's goal was to pray that those whom he was teaching would be given wisdom so that they might know God better. As it was, they were evidencing that they did not know God very well. And in fact, were in danger of not growing if they kept disobeying the Lord. Paul makes a clear distinction. Paul and the leaders of the churches are God's servants. They will be rewarded according to their works in Christ, but it's God who builds the building and the servants. Not the servants. It's not the servants that build the building. You know, we often forget that today. We see ministries with people's names on them and assume that they're the ones building the building. I think of people like Joel Osteen with his huge monstrosity of a Colosseum that he uses for a church, supposedly. But you know, it's God who builds his church, and we are called to be unified in him. Those who have chosen to go, go their way unrepentant are one thing, and we are to avoid them. But those who are called according to his purpose, the most important part of which is to build the spiritual building of the church, must submit to the Lord not be jealous of one another, not try to be the greatest, but be the lowest servant and allow God to do the real work. You know, uh, there's a pyramid uh, in, uh, of leadership in the world and there, people are always trying to reach the pinnacle of the pyramid. But Jesus inverted that. Jesus is all the way at the bottom. And if we want to be greater in Christ, we reach down toward the bottom, being a servant to all. You know, we are simply God's workers in his field and on his building. We have to remember that it's not our field or building, but his. God is the one who's building his church. We're simply called to preach the gospel and disciple people. But it's the Holy Spirit that brings the increase and is our teacher who builds us up to maturity in the faith. You know, there are many men out there who uh, are trying to build their own building. When they do that, it's no longer God's building, but it's their building. They may build big buildings, but it's not going to have the blessing of God on it or in it. That's why it's so important to submit to God in the building of his church. Otherwise, we can actually be doing something against God. 
Let's move on to verse 10. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his, word will, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he's built survives, he will receive his reward. If it's burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. You know, uh, Paul laid the uh, foundation for the Gentile church by preaching the gospel and discipling. But he was not building a building unto himself, trying to get followers to Paul. He always remembered who is the foundation. You know, we can lay a foundation of a church in terms of preaching and teaching, but that church has to be laid on the foundation of the rock, Jesus Christ. This is why I often tell people to find a Bible-believing, Christ-centered church. You know, when the foundation gets off the center of Jesus Christ and the cross and gets away from Bible teaching, that church isn't going to grow in the Lord. Those who use the wood, hay, or straw of popular psychology, postmodern thought, false teachings, woke, new revelation, will have their work judged in the end. Those who build on the gold, silver, and precious stones of Jesus Christ and his word will be rewarded. On the day of the judgment seat of Christ, those who were the leadership of churches will either gain a reward or have their efforts burned up. Now, this is talking about true believers, not false teachers and false prophets and heretics. Those will be sent to hell. The people Paul is talking about are true believers. Those who do not, cent uh, do not center on Christ and teach through the Bible will have their works burned up. And they'll be saved, but only just barely as a person escaping a burning house. You know what? We should always be laying up treasure in heaven by teaching and doing what the Lord has asked us to do. It's actually fairly simple, but a lot of people can't handle it. First Timothy 6.19, in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. And of course, Luke 12, 34 says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Those who teach the truth and lead many to righteousness will be rewarded on the day of the judgment of the believers. Daniel 12, 3, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens. Those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Those who are Christian leaders who do not help people by focusing on Christ and his word will have their works burned up and will not receive a reward other than eternal life. Again, this is not talking about false teachers who will end up in hell. Uh, Revelation 21, 8 addresses those, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars. Their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Those who overcome by the power of the spirit and by wearing the armor of God will not suffer the second death, but will be part of the resurrection to life eternal. Again, Revelation 2.11, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. Folks, we have a lot to overcome today. We need to be overcomers. This world, the flesh, and the devil are after us nonstop. 
and I should say our sinful nature. We really need to overcome today. But as we overcome, the Lord teaches us patience and faith. Go on to verse 16. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred, and you are that temple. Do not deceive yourselves. If any one of you thinks he's wise by the standards of this age, he should become a fool so he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then, no more boasting about men. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world or life or death of the present or the future. All are yours, and you are of Christ, and Christ is of God. I believe that God's temple is both his church, in his church, and in each believer. The temple is no longer in Jerusalem, but within his universal church and within every believer. Christ paid the final penalty for our sins on the cross. Therefore, there is no more need for a physical temple. The current temple of God is in every believer and in his church. We must not allow ourselves or the church to be destroyed. Of course, God protects his church and the gates of hell cannot pre prevail against it, as in Matthew 16, 18, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I build my church, and the gates of Hades, or hell, will not overcome it. Again, it's God who builds his church, and the devil cannot destroy that. But people can destroy the faith of others and corrupt whole churches with false doctrines, false prophecies, false anointings, lying signs and wonders, immorality, etc. I note here Hillsong has been absolutely racked with immorality lately. You know, Paul is jumping now to addressing false teachers and leaders who lead people astray because he says that those who cause others to stumble will be destroyed. You know, this is not the case with believers who show little works. Destruction is reserved for those who are really not really born again and who are leading people astray in various ways. Paul admonishes us to get God's wisdom, not the false wisdom of the world. Those who lead others astray may sound wise, but they're really teaching the foolish wisdom of the world that leads to destruction. So how can we avoid that trap? Well. You already know the question, the answer to that. We need to be studying God's word and asking the Lord for wisdom to understand it through the Holy Spirit. If we're relying on our own understanding, we will fail and possibly even mislead others. We need God's understanding of his written word. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. One of the signs of our time is full of the foolishness of people, and that people who claim to be Christians end up following and defending a teacher they admire. But Paul has revealed and, uh, and will continue to reveal in these lessons that doing that's wrong. You know, we are of Christ. We're not of Chuck Smith or who knows who, you know, whoever you're listening to. The benefits of being a, a believer is that they're in Christ and therefore all the promises he's made to them will be fulfilled. God's promises are fulfilled in those who continue in Christ. We who are born again are in Christ. We need to 
use that relationship. We need to ask the Holy Spirit for wisdom. We need to actually be studying the word, not acting like we are and not actually studying it. Actually reading the word and absorbing it. Why? Because when we absorb it into our lives and in our minds and our hearts, then the Lord can bring that to our minds when we're witnessing to others and trying to help others. We might not always have a Bible right there available. We need to have it in our head as well. So that's my uh, uh, admonition to you today. Study the word. Be ready anytime to witness to people and to disciple people and to try to help them. Well, I want to thank those who've been here on live stream today. Thank you for listening in. And uh, I want to also thank all of you who are here on Zoom with me today. And uh, really appreciate it. Mm -hmm.